But can the world be better? Absolutely. Do I dream of a better world for my children? Yes. And I think I'm hopeful. Very, very hopeful to see some of the things I think your generation can create. Let me jump and talk about someone that I admire dearly. And uh, if you will forgive me of using him, if there are some of you who might be upset with it, I doubt so. Two years ago, I had a chance to go to Dharamsala uh, at India. And there are many different leaders that I admire, um, whether you agree with it or not, right? It's just people that I admire that I look up to. Uh, of course, I'm sure you one of them is proud of uh, I followed his career uh, when he was a senator, or during Time magazine, and they were making a focus on him. I thought, this guy is really, really interesting. That was 2007. Um, and then, he's now in the second term, and so on. Um, and then there are other people that I look up to, that I read a lot, and I find some of them in the for example. Um, incredible, incredible stories. And of course, there are local people that I mind, I look up to. Uh, in Singapore, with someone like Lily, really one new uh, Some people may not agree, but as far as I'm concerned, I think the will not be what it is today. It's not for him and his team of leaders. Right? Many years ago, uh, Alton did a tribute to our leaders. There were 10 founding cabinet ministers. Uh, we got 10 of Singapore artists uh, together with 5,000 Singaporeans who put thumbprints on it. So it was a 10 location that we have 10 ministers. Uh, Singaporeans put thumbprints on National Day. And then the artist would take all those companies and create an artwork. And the artwork would give to the 10 families of the family. That's our way of paying tribute to this leader. One man that I admire a lot uh, is this guy. Two years ago, I had a chance of uh, spending 40 minutes with His Holiness the Lord Now, I am a Christian. He and I don't see eye to eye on our religious glory. We are on bipolar opposites when it comes to religion. But I have seen, uh, at least my interaction with him and, and learning from his stories, he is one of the most jovial men I've ever met. Um, we were quite excited about it because we get to spend 40 minutes with him. There was about 12 of us, 11 of us. Uh, BBC only got 10 minutes. And BBC went before us. We were out there speaking at the interview. And, we, and, the, and the BBC reporter was the same flight as our house. So it was easy to give you a family to your home. Uh, a friend of ours was elected the Prime Minister of the Federal Government next to our home side. Uh, so when he got elected, uh, a couple of us, he invited a couple of us, they wanted to come and visit. So we did. And then he arranged for us to make his cabinet and so on. Uh, and I spent time learning about the things that's happening in China, things happening in Japan, and so on. Now, again, you've got to listen to all that to make your own conclusions, okay? I'm not here to tell you what political views they are. But I'm going to tell you about this man. The Dalai Lama is known as both the spiritual leader and the political head of the Tibetan government in exile. Right? So the Tibetan people, they were exiled in the 1960s, they went to the Himalayas, and then they escaped. India opened up, and they all opened up, so they have two settlements that they settled on. They have uh, now the countrymen in about 10 different places. A couple of years ago, the Tibetan government in exile, the Tibetan people in exile, ran the first uh, free and fair elections. They ran in 10 countries in two days. 10 countries in two days, and a democratically elected uh, prime minister, his name is Lok San Sang Ke, who never grew up in Tibet. He was a law professor at Harvard and a professor of Tibetan studies. Um, when Lok San finally won, he won in incumbents and people who had been in Tibet who knew the Dalai Lama. Uh, but he won because the people wanted to change. The people wanted a new leader who would take them to the new era of that. Shortly after the Lhasa War, which really was a landslide for him, the Dalai Lama said this to the media without telling uh, his others. He said that I am going to relinquish all powers, all authority, all leadership, because the people have chosen a leader, and I'm prepared to back this leader. The one thing about leadership and power you have to understand is the power is a very seductive thing. That's what you You can go in with the clearest and the best of intention, but the moment you taste power, it changes you. Some in a good way, some in a not so good way. History is full of examples of people who keep power and who try to keep power at all costs. Sometimes, 
even the call of human lives. You have this man who is seen as a spiritual leader, who really doesn't need to, because he really told China he's going to live for 116 years old. So he just said, China, don't wait for me to die. Because China is waiting for you to die. He said, don't wait, don't fall down. Go live for 116 years old. Okay, all right. And he willingly gave away everything. The, the news media asked him why. You know what he said? He said that my people are real. How do you know that? Because they chose Rosa. Because they understand democracy and they understand that their vote can change the country. And they said, if my people are ready, I am ready. The parliament came together and Rosa and his cabinet came together and said, we can't, we can't allow, you are the icon of this country. You can't go this way. He refused to take any form of uh, position. So much so that the parliament came together and told him, say, uh, uh, the holiness, what if you become our equivalent of a monarch? Huh? That means become like a king. Ceremonial, nothing, you're just a figurehead like most countries, so you don't have no power, it's just a monarch. You know what he said? Which really, really thought I thought this is a cool guy. He said this. If I am a monarch, I will need a queen. But I am a monk. <laughs> so don't want to. And he went on to be a tax paying citizen. For that, and for the time that I spent with him, I found myself in the field. We see different, we have very, very different views when it comes to religion, when it comes to upper life. But you know what? I saw in him a man that I would say, you know what? I know why people would follow him, would follow him with him. Because it's humble, it's jovial, it's down to work. And we asked them to say, no, if you have an advice, you have to go what they And this is what they said. They said, I will not see peace in my lifetime. Right? So this was a group, and you'll see one of them coming uh, later. He said this, he said, I will, you will not, I will not see peace in my lifetime. But you will see peace in your life. Right? I will not see peace in my lifetime, but you will see peace in your lifetime. And this is what he said. Whether I am in heaven or I am in hell, I will be watching you to make sure that you will achieve the peace of your life. And I repeat that to every point I read, but a lot of the prophets that I speak. Because peace is something that I think we can be in the short. But it requires us to take the now why do I bring up the Holy of God? Well, is this happening or really did it come from your actions? Um, because I wanted to talk to you in our next session about different types of leadership. We ended the session talking about leadership as an influence. And I want to introduce to you another definition of leadership that I found to be uh, extremely useful for me. I'm going to share with you some of the findings that I have found in my lifetime about leaders. What is leadership? According to Jim and Barry Foster, uh, they write the book called The Leadership Challenge. Two Americans in California uh, who have become really good friends. They define leadership as the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle or share aspiration. Now, if you do leadership studies, you will find one consistent which is that most leadership definitions are positive in nature, most. There are very, very few and rare leadership definitions that have to do with negative. What is leadership? It's the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle for shared aspiration. Now, let me dissect that for you very quickly. You have to understand Jim. Jim, as an author, is a word freak. I find a word freak. Uh, Laura and I were talking about work with friends. Uh, they work with friends. How many of you play work with friends? Okay, none. <laughs> yeah, but you're very interesting. I, I make a mistake. I play with publishers. Uh, wrong people to play with. Um, he loves the English language. Now, most of us have dictionaries. How many of you have English dictionary? Okay. Oh, well, this is getting worrying. Uh, you should at least have an English dictionary. Uh, I have about three English dictionaries at home. Not because I use them that regularly, but because I keep losing them. <laughs> you know how it's like? You want a dictionary and then you look for it, you can't find it. And, you know, and back then, now it's all on the internet. Then you buy another one, then you find the other one, and then you need another one, and you find another one. <laughs> um, 
I have three. Jim has only one dictionary. His one dictionary is 32 volumes. 32 volumes of English words forming one dictionary. He's a word freak. Every word he chooses for this definition has gone through different iterations to find the right one. So, the art. Why is leadership art? The opposite of art would be why is leadership not science? Pardon? Cannot be quantified. Cannot be quantified? What was that? It can. Because you can observe people's behavior. But it's something about art that is different than science. Science is a formula to it, right? Right? There's a formula to it for science. But leadership doesn't quite have a formula. Uh, leadership in one sense is uh, part of uh, the creative aspect of an individual. Okay. And there, there are two. It's either you become a, a tyrant or a uh, benevolent person. Yeah. When, when you use the, the skill to become a leader. And with that, these are only two, two strategies. Yeah. But you're using it uh, in a manner uh, conversely and uh, simultaneously and with a bit of combinations in order for you to act with Very good. So there are different aspects of leadership. Right? Um, one, of the, one of the things that I love, I love art. Uh, I was at Siam Green. Um, and um, I, I absolutely love the place. Angkor Wat is one of my bucket lists. You understand what the bucket list? Yeah. Alright? It's before you kick the bucket, right? Uh, <laughs> Angkor Wat was one of the places I wanted to visit. I uh, was on my bucket list. On the day I was there, guess what? You know there's two, power, two big towers, right? One of them was under renovation. <laughs> so I went all my life to go to Angkor Wat and then finally I'm there. There was one of them under renovation. So I have to creatively take a photo with my head covering it. So that looks nice, right? Anyway. And you gave me a Hala Bay, beautiful place. Angkor Wat was not the Hala Bay. Angkor Wat, you have to visit it. It really is one. Uh, I love art. I almost bought a canvas from uh, Siamri. Uh, it's actually an industry uh, of royal gardens. Uh, I do the impression of art. Now the one thing about art you need to understand is that it's extremely subjective. Some people like it, some people don't. Agree? Yes. Right? That's art. Some people like it, some people don't. The art that you like very much, your friends may hate it. But the art that your friends like, other people may not like. It's the same with leadership. Leadership is subjective. There are some leaders that you like, that your friends don't. There are some leaders that your friends like that you don't. Does that make sense? So there is no one fixed way to success. If anyone come and tell you, come for my leadership program, I'll make you the best leader ever, it's a lie. You can't. Because leadership is a journey. You grow as a leader. You learn, you nurture. There is no destination. It's only a journey. It's a subjective one at that. So there is no right or wrong answer. What is important is to find what is the one, the philosophy that you believe. Two, leadership is about mobilizing others. It's no more than just mobilizing yourself. Because there's a famous saying, he who thinks that he is leading, but has no one following him, is only taking a walk. He who thinks that he is leading, but has no one following him, is only taking a walk. The reality is that leadership is about relationships. Have to work with another person, another group of people. It's about mobilizing others. To what? To what to struggle? Why is leadership a struggle? You know, our fallacy of leadership is that someone in power commanding people to go. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It's not as simple as that. Leadership is often a struggle, a big struggle. The higher you go in an organization, the lonelier you become. Let me repeat that for you. The higher you go in organization, the, the lower you become. Why? Because the decision you make gets harder and harder and harder. Leadership is often a struggle. But what do you struggle for? It's about struggling for shared aspirations. Not about my aspiration, not about just your aspiration, but about shared aspiration. We must win. It must be for the well-being of everyone. If it's just for me, I use this as an example. Many of you are students.
Can you imagine a principal of your school or one of the schools? A principal comes in into the into the staff room and tells all the teachers, this year we're going to be the best school in the whole of Southeast Asia. We will work very hard. We'll be the number one education, premier education institution of the whole of Southeast Asia. I want you to work very, very hard. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., get our students to study because when we become the number one and premier institution of Southeast Asia, I will get promoted. <laughs> you think you'll focus on that? No. No. <laughs> Leadership is about shared aspiration. But there's two more words in this definition that I want to bring you to. And it's the word want. Why is it important? Because you know what, as leaders, we can force people to do it. You can force people to struggle. The world are full of examples of leaders who force people to struggle. To a certain extent, as a parent, I have the ability to force my daughter to struggle. It's called violent class. <laughs> Marilyn, when she was three years old, knew that she wanted to play the violin. Every time we go past the music shop, they said, anyone want to play the violin? Now, in my mind, I said, quit your seven years old, they will start. But when she was about four, she was asking me non stop, I want another violin. We started home with the piano, but she said, I just want another violin. So, Taking that passion, I do what all parents would do, which is to get another violin. But I made her promise me something. Now, don't, don't say that evil, okay? Yeah? Uh, this, this, this a parent thing stuff. Maybe one of the piano when she was very young, I said, I have an agreement with my children. I said, You want to learn an instrument, I can force you. Alright? Uh, very early on, me and my wife decided that we will not talk to our children in the so we will talk to them like an adult, yeah. right? So uh, the way we communicate with them, because parents more parents model the linguistic ability of the children, right? If you talk, if you talk in baby languages, that's what they will talk. Right? If you talk in full sentences, that's how they will talk. So we decided to talk with full sentences. So I, I told them like I will I will with any of my staff. I said, do you really want to do it? Yes, I want to. On one condition, you cannot say that. I don't care what you will say. You cannot give up because it's your choice. And then Marilyn said, okay. <laughs> so today, she has a hard time trying to keep up with the practice. And guess what I remind her? I didn't make you choose violin. You chose yourself. You can't give up because you promised me. Parents have the ability to make their children do something and struggle. Right? So do leaders. Leaders have the ability to force people to struggle. But you know what? The art of leadership is mobilizing others to want to struggle. And it comes back to the Dalai Lama. When I was in Dalai Lama, when Lok Sang won the election, he needed to form a cabinet. And when we were there, I met this 74 year old gentleman who is the Minister of Culture. And he had the best. He's like, he, he was a young man when he exiled together with the Dalai Lama. After he went to Nepal and settled in India, he got a scholarship as a young man. He went to the States to study, got married in the US to another dependent lady. And they had children, and his grandfather now. He stayed in Florida. Do you know how beautiful Florida is? No. I don't know, I've never been. <laughs> but I'm told Florida is beautiful. I'm told the weather there is beautiful. But on winter, it's like 16 degrees Celsius. Not all right. But that's what Disneyland is, man. Disneyland is coming that way. So, uh, Florida is a wonderful weather. Beautiful, beautiful weather. Dark Sala during winter, minus 24 degrees. He's a 74-year-old grandfather. He was asked by Lok Sam, can you come back and help? You know what he did? He came back. And I asked him this question. I said, why did you come back? Your family is in Florida, your wife is in Florida, your grandchildren in Florida. You are 74 years old. You are at retirement. You know what he said? He said, my leader asked for me, my husband. Because this is my country, so I don't come to The art of mobilizing others to want to struggle. That's the advantage of leaderships. And if we have the ability to inspire people towards a cause, say, you know what? I'm going to go out of my way to get this done. Then, I think we can 
do a lot of things that will change the way you and I live in this world. At the end of the day, it's all about mental models. Convincing people to change what they are used to. I'm going to leave you with five things um, that have served me very well. This I use your lesson that I, that I think, I mean personally, when I was asked about my own leadership philosophy. Uh, I never thought of this five things. I've been working on it, but I thought I'll share this with you. These are five things that I think, when it comes to leadership, is almost absolutely vital to remember. So what are these five things? Number one, you need to choose to lead. Leadership is a choice and aspiration. You know what? You can never be thrust into a leadership position that you don't choose. Because if you are thrown in the leadership position and you are a captain of the team and you didn't want to, you could choose to just manage it, right? Just keep everything the same. Whatever the previous leader do, we do. End of story. That's more of a manager. But a leader must choose and decide for himself a deliberate decision. You know what? I'm going to choose to do. And if all of you are in leadership position of some man, you have got to choose and make a deliberate choice that I am going to leave, I'm not just not going to manage. Because when you make that decision, your, your leadership and your decision making will be very different. You will look on new ways to better the whole organization. You will look on new ways to better people's lifestyle and so on and so forth. Because leadership is a choice. So first and foremost, for us as young people, we must learn that we number one, we must choose to be. Number two, everywhere we go, we need to leave a mark. If we don't leave a mark, we become irrelevant to the community that we're in. A very simple life philosophy that I have, I have little nuggets of life philosophy that guide, guide me in what I do. My goal in life is that every person I meet and every organization I'm with, I want to leave it in a better place than when I first came. If I meet a person for the first time, I hope you will leave this place meeting me in a slightly better place than you were before you met. That's, that's all I ask. I don't need fame, I don't need glory, all I need, all I would like is to be able to leave a market everywhere that I go. So in every organization I'm in, I look to live one. Because it really doesn't matter. I, I shouldn't be saying this at this at this age, but fame and glory are overrated. Can I say this? But I want you to still strive for it, right? But can I say that it's overrated? Um, I tell you what is not, I, I think what is underrated is the impact you have on me. We have, during our team break, we were listening to Mora's story. Um, you should ask her to share with you some of her story about the places that she has been, you know, the impact, uh, the kind of work that she will put herself through. Uh, in places in Sri Lanka, in the north part of Sri Lanka, the Tamil Islands, and so on. We don't talk about enough of, of people who are doing great things. We meet a lot of all the celebrities and so on and so forth. We just don't spend enough time hearing stories of people like us or you know, doing the things in a spectacular way. That, that's not my favorite glory, but you know what the impact that we create is so long lasting. So fame and glory in a world that I think is over. But I think the power of ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things is under me. Because that's where all of us can play out. So everywhere we go, we need our marketing So that the place, the people that we work with just become a little bit better. We can't change the world overnight, but we can change the world one person at a time. Number three. You are not always right. You know, sometimes well, I have had leaders who always say, I am the leader, I know what's best. And I say it's not true. I make mistakes all the time, leaders make mistakes all the time. The greatest, the greatest of mistakes is that leaders don't think they can be wrong. We live in a very complex world, and I'm going to come to it in a while. We live in a very, very complex world. No one person has all the answers. And we must be humble enough to go to people 
what that I don't know. I may be wrong. Tell me what you think. And if our staff or if our people that we need come to us and say, I think I'm making the wrong decision, we should at least be humble enough to leave to say, you know what, maybe I am not. I can be wrong. Leaders are not right all the time. You are not always right. The fourth thing is that the success of others is the success of you. Our role as leaders, and I think someone said this earlier, our role as leaders is to help people we lead be successful. You know why? I have learned this trick all these years. When my staff are successful, guess what? I'm successful. It's a very weird thing. People spend a lot of time trying to be successful themselves by using other people. But yet I have found in all my years of leadership that when I spend my time helping my team to be successful, I end up being successful. And I find it to be far better because it's multiplication of the impact that I give and effort that I put. So if we as leaders focus on helping my team people to be as successful as they can be, the young people I work with to be as successful as they can be, this is how I put it. I don't need to be the richest man in the world. I just need rich friends. Is that right? I'm going to the rich friend in the world, I just need rich friends. So my goal is for the young people that I train to be as successful as they can be. All I ask in return is this remember. That's all. You know, once in a while, private in a private jet and lunch. And that's all I ask. I, I don't need I don't a lot of you, I really don't. All right, once in a while, give money to the house of But I have done all these things, and the success of I is I'd rather my success be a, a little set of be judged by the students that we train more than what we need to do. And I found that to be very, very useful. Last but not least, the fifth thing is the exception. This is not a Photoshop image. This is in Hong Kong. This is my phone. Oops. The duck is that big. It's huge. I've never imagined a rubber duck can captive a country's imagination. Did you know when I was in Hong Kong when there was a Danish artist who created this? Did you know that because of the weather, the duck deflated? Alright? The duck deflated. It was front page news in Hong Kong that the duck deflated. It was a news in Singapore that the duck deflated. It is a duck. <laughs> For 